Good morning, everyone. Love that you all made it here. You all bright-eyed here. That's good. Well, we are uh, in a series, obviously, talking about the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to kind of do a little bit of a transition phase right now in, in, the, uh, in the Lord's Prayer. Because the first part that Jim's been talking about the last few weeks is mostly about vertical, putting God in his place. Our Father, heart in heaven, hallowed be your name. God, you deserve to be on the throne of our lives. You deserve to be on the throne. Uh, you, you, you are, your will is above our will. And so the first part we talk about is mostly directed towards heaven and towards God's positioning. We make the transition now. We're going to start kicking into more about God's addressing our needs. The things that he's being more, this is more of a vertical with us and Jesus. Jesus kind of saying, there are things that we basically need in this life. And I was a little nervous uh, looking through some of the other topics of this series because, you know, it's like some of them are pretty deep, you know, forgiveness and temptation and, and hallowed being. I mean, how do you explain that? I was like, man, I hope I don't want any of those topics. And then it got to bread. And I thought, I like bread. Bread is a great one. I'll, I'll do the bread one. That's, that sounds like an easy one. How many of you guys love bread? Come on. Be your head. There you go. How many of you, what's your favorite restaurant with bread? Mm, nice, good, good selections. Mine is Texas Roadhouse. Texas Roadhouse, man. You walk in or you get the peanuts, and then they bring the rolls. Now, the funny thing for me is when you walk into Texas Roadhouse, they got this little hostess girl that runs up. I'll take you to your table now. And you're like, okay. And she reaches up for this one thing of bread and one cinnamon butter. And I'm like, uh, can you make that a double, please? <laughs> Triple if you can throw one in there. Because I like the cinnamon butter. That's almost my second favorite part of the roll is the cinnamon butter. So she puts that in there, takes it back to the table, and I am just eating that stuff like crazy. Now, I know most people, you maybe eat one, and that's you seem satisfied. I eat a minimum of probably five to six. <laughs> I, I would say, wouldn't I, I'll go through a bat. This is my basket, kids. Don't touch. Get your hands off my stuff. Get your hands. And so I'm just putting cinnamon butter, and I could go through a cinnamon butter pour roll. Now, the funny thing is, by the time I'm walking out of there, I am stuffed before my steak even gets there. You know what I mean? You're like, you're, I've had all rolls, I've had three or four Cokes, and I am just stuffed. My, then they bring the steak out, and I'm like, okay, I paid for that. i got to eat that. You know, I'm like shoving it in. And it's, and it's just how we live. And, you know, by the time I'm walking out of there, I'm kind of in like this cinnamon butter uh, intoxication mode. You know, it's kind of like, oh, my gosh, am I going to be able to? And you get to go, can, will the seatbelt still fit around me? You know, like that. You've already undone a couple of buttons and stuff. And that is kind of when we think of bread. We think of bread as kind of like this free appetizer that comes, that's easily given, and it's just free. But when Jesus was teaching this and when he was speaking to a people, mostly Jewish people, in their recollection, when they see the word bread, their thoughts go back to manna. They go back to a time when the Israelites are wandering the desert, wandering the wilderness. For 40 years, they're dependent upon manna that's falling from the heavens. Now, that's just hard for us American people to really kind of get a grip on. Because we are gorged ourselves, and it's a free appetizer to get our money's worth at dinner. For them, it was a mainstay. You know how they got that bread? They were whining about starving to death. You know, we kind of make fun of them sometimes. We're going, they're in a desert wandering. They're hungry. God, should we just go back and be slaves again? And so God responds. He provides. He gives provision. And there's also daily manna falls from heaven. And I have to think this, though, first thing. Who's the first one that thought something falling out of the sky was good to eat? Because normally when something's falling out of the sky, you don't eat that. You take it, don't eat that, you know. <laughs> but somebody had been down and they picked that and they ate it and it was, it was sustaining. And every day, and so how the manna worked, it would fall from heaven. And each day, by the end of the day, it would rot and spoil. So you couldn't even save it for the next day. So you were dependent, praying that God would do it again tomorrow. And for 40 years, this is pretty much the commonplace existence of the Israelite people. And so the people he's speaking, Jesus speaking to at this time, he's speaking to Jews who, who, this wasn't just like a legend. This was common knowledge. Their descendants, the people, they, they kind of, my, my great, great or whatever, they lived that. And so for them, it was very real. When he says, give us today 
our daily bread. That was like a, oh, a, oh okay, that makes sense. Give us those things I need. Now, the bread represents more than just bread. It represents more than just a physical eating bread. It is kind of when we talk about the bread, we're kind of considering really those things that sustain us, the things that we need to survive, those things in our lives, and it goes beyond just the physical, and it gets into a lot of other different realms. As a matter of fact, I put three of those up here on the screen for you. Let me see if I can find those here for you. Here's three of my three basic needs. Look at these. We need physical fulfillment. We need emotional fulfillment. And we need spiritual purpose. We could also put the word fulfillment under those behind that word also. We have these basic needs. Whether you are an Israelite who is looking for, you know, starving to death and needs something to sustain us, we still have these needs even today. And, and as I was went into prepping this message, I was really struggling. How do you teach this to a bunch of people who have to loosen their belt after dinner? Because most of us in this room have not gone too many days without food. Matter of fact, some of us could use a few days without some food, really. You know what I'm talking about? That's where I'm at. I'm like, I could do a couple days without eating and gorging myself. So how do I teach it? And so this is kind of what I came up with, was just this idea that we all have three basic needs. And whether we're just going to look at it a little bit backwards. For them in the prayer, God says, give us today. And what I kind of kicked into my mind was going, most of us have too much but there's still these needs are still there, and we try to fulfill these needs uh, on our own. But when we look at these needs, uh, this is just how it works for me. I personally could probably pull off the physical fulfillment for a long time on my own, can't I? I could work every day of my every day of the week and pull it off. I could make enough money to do it. But when I do that, the other two are going to suffer. That's the downside. I might be able to pull off one of the others completely, try doing it on my own. But in the process of pulling that off, the others are going to suffer. And so we're stuck. And what we finally kind of come to grips with is, I can't pull this off on my own. I need something greater than me to do this. And this is, comes the very first thing, and we're probably going to pound this into our brains today, is my goal. And this is the word that many of us don't like, is the word dependence. We don't like being dependent on anybody. We're self-motivated. We're self-warners. We're self we, We're very self. We can do this. I mean, a lot of us, that's how we think. Well, I can pull this off on my own. I'm a, I'm a self-made man. But when it comes to these needs, you can't do it. You can't pull them off. They require our dependence on something else. And God is saying that dependence is on him. And so as we kind of just go into this, the rest of what we're talking about today, we're going to keep coming back to this mentality. We're going to ask a question. And it's going to be a very question. Matter of fact, let's just do the first one. I'll show you how this is going to work. What if I run out of blank? See, this is a basic need that we have. We, I don't know about you, but I'm driven not out, of my, not out of necessity sometimes, but I have this surplus that I want to hold on to. I want to keep it, and I'm afraid that someday I'm going to hold on to it so tight because someday I might need it later. I might, it might run out, and so I'm going to grip onto it, and I'm going to hold it so tight because I need it. It's my security blanket. And the reason I'm not going to fill in this blank is this, because each one of us has something that we worry about running out of. A lot of us, majority of us, I'll say, what if I run out of money? My dependence, you see this battle for defense. I don't want to depend on anybody else to, to, to provide for me, but, so I have to do this myself, and I've, got, I've, I've pulled it off pretty good for a while. What if I run out? And so what do we, how does that change, how does that change our behavior when we're afraid of running out of something? What do we do? Anyone? Hoarders, you become a hoarder. You start making decisions based on how can I keep this, not on how I can use this. Isn't that what happens? And so it starts impacting. So we don't go out of need. I need food. We're going, how can I keep it? How can I keep this to keep one of my, fulfill one of my three basic needs? So for you, what would go into that line? 
What would be going under there? What would go under there? What are you most stressed out about losing and running out of? I put down some for myself. What if I ran out of money? Easy one. What if I run out of health? What if I could run out of my 401k? Those of us getting a little bit older now are like 401k. I would, at 20, like 4 what? You know? For us, it's 401k. We know what that means. What if I, let's see what else some of the ones I wrote down. What if I run out of college funds for my kids? What if I run out of room in my house? These are all things that we worry about and we stress about running out of. What if my business doesn't, what if the economy tanks and I run out of business for my company? Those are legitimate, real, physical needs that we worry about. And it troubles us because our self-reliance gets all tied up where our anxiety levels start shooting up and soaring up because we think in our minds that I got it and I got to keep it. And it changes how we deal with other people. It changes our relationships and our family. It changes the amount of time we spend with our family. We'll get to that a little bit more as we go on. Um, The funny thing is, this is the breakdown. We feel that we earned it and it's ours to hoard. Let me tell you a story. Okay, how many guys are, raise your, if you're a parent, have kids, you have kids, raise your hands, please, thank you, okay. You will relate to this one moment of your time. At one point in time, maybe if your kid's a teenager, they go, it's my phone. It's my room, you can't come in here. <laughs> then there's a big, this starts boiling inside. Or, uh, what is it? It's my car, I can go where I want. And you're like, oh, really? It's your car, huh? You can't afford a pack of bubble gum. What does that do to us as parents? What, what, what are some of the feelings, emotions we start getting? Anger? <laughs> what do we think about our kids at those moments? Not We love you kids, we do. But what are those moments, those thoughts in your mind, what are they? Ungrateful? Selfish? You guys are doing good? You haven't got to the one I was thinking. <laughs> You spoiled little brat. Do you know what I mean? And I just think that is kind of where most of us live. We, go, we hear kids say that. We go, it's mine. And you're going, no, it's not. It's mine. You try getting that room out of my house and we'll see what happens. And you start kicking into those parental things. Well, as long as you live under my house, you know, those kind of things, roofy, those things start kicking in. You turn into that parent of like you heard before, because you know what? You were the kid and you said it to your parents at one point in time. We've all been there. But I just kind of laugh because I wonder if this is how God sees us sometimes. Think about this. This passage in God's base, Jesus is basically saying, He's saying it to a group of people back then, but even today, there's things that we say, that's mine. I have the right to keep it. I have the right to hoard it. It's mine. And God's going, I paid for that. I gave that to you. You ever try to think, just think about trying to yank a cell phone out of a 14-year-old's hands? It's like murder. They might take you out for that. And I think they probably, it's justified. I told my friends, I killed them because they, they, they took my phone. Oh, that's understandable. That's how crazy. But I wonder if many of us, if we were honest, and we look at this question, what if I ran out of this? Are you holding on to that just like a teenager's holding on to their cell phone? And would you be willing to say, God, you can take all this other stuff, but you're not taking this one because if I run out of this, it's over. And so Jesus says, give us, give us, Give us, and that's the part here, it's a gift. We think we earn all this stuff. And God's going, I want you to understand that I I give it. I'm going to give it to you. You didn't earn it. But you also got to understand that when you're given something, it doesn't really always completely become yours. Does that make sense? You give your kid a phone, it's theirs to use, but it's not really theirs. You paid for it. You pay the bill each month. And God pays the price every month. Matter of fact, the, the things he gives us, he paid a high, high price on. He sacrificed his son for some of the things that we, for what we were given. He uses people to do miraculous things. To get to, and you know what some of those miraculous things are? Sacrifice. 
death. There are people in this world right now who when they wake up to preach the word of God this morning, they're afraid if they're going to make it home. They're willing to sacrifice it all. So this is the first thing. So we're going to change the question. This can be the question we're going to ask each time. How do things change? What if I depend on God? We're going to ask this after every point that we do today. What if I depend on God? How does it change the things, how I look at things? And it's what God, when Jesus is saying in the Lord's Prayer, he's saying, take a moment at all these things that you think are going on, all these things that you're afraid of running out of. What if in this situation with that item that was on that line for you, you depend on God with it? How does that change things? How does that change your life? Pastor the Bible says this in uh, John, 3, 6, John 6, 35. says, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. What about that physical thing that you thought was on that line that was so important that you were afraid of running out of? If you change that and you said, I'm going to depend on God to sustain me. And this is also where Jesus basically is saying that bread that the, the, the Israelites understood to be life-sustaining, he's basically saying, I am life-sustaining for you. How does that change how you answer your questions? This week, when you're stressing out about that thing that was on the line, in your prayer time, because that's what we're talking about, how to pray, how am I going to depend on God with this, my money? How am I going to depend on God? Because it's going to change things. The pastor's never said, give us today our daily purse, our daily shoes. It says, give us today our daily bread, my sustenance, what I need for today. Here's the next what if line. What if I miss out? You see, uh, for the kind of the last one, my wife and I were having this conversation a few weeks ago, and the conversation was kind of going like this. We're talking about money and time, and I had this, just finished this kind of like, Mm, like a week and a half, 10-day period of time where I didn't get home till about 9.30 every night. Uh, I do real estate to pay the bills. And I, I was gone every night. I was with clients every night. I'm basically getting there just to give the kiss, kids a kiss goodnight on their cheek and put them to bed for about 10 days straight. And I know some of you guys, that's worse for you. You work night shift. You drive trucks. I understand. But in our family, this is kind of a big deal. And I said, Jen, you know, my, my, I really have some goals in my mind. And I said, you know, I really want to make... You know, I really want to kind of, you know, make this money now. And her question was this. She goes, how much is enough? Isn't that a painful question? How much is enough? And I have to be honest. I, I know what I wanted to answer. <laughs> I didn't say it because I knew this was a rhetorical question. I knew those, those moments. And then here I was like, luckily something shut it off before it got to my mouth. But I wanted to say more. I want more. How much is enough? More. Does that make sense? But you know what, really, if I be honest, it wasn't the money. I didn't worry about the last one where I run out of money. There's this magazine they put out for real estate, real estate people, and it's called Top Producer. And inside of Top Producer is a chart and a list, as you turn the pages, of the top 200 real estate agents in the city. I went on that list. I really do. One time I want to make that list. I don't care if I'm 200 A, B, I, I just 200. I don't care if I'm the last one. I want to make that list. And when I look at this, um, the how much is my, sorry, can you go to what if I miss out? Sorry. If I think about what am I going to miss out, I feel like I'm going to miss out on an opportunity to make that list, my acclaim. And we all have inside of us this thing that we think, if I do this, if I do this other thing, if I change and do what God wants me to do, I'm going to miss out on this thing that I think is so important, that I think is important. So what it goes on your line? What if I miss out on this? Maybe for you, what's afraid you're afraid you're going to miss out on a new job? What if I miss out on a relationship that might be better than the one I'm in now? We have a high divorce rate within the church. What if I'm missing out? What if I miss out on uh, my, I worry so much about health that I 
basically do exercise and you think, oh, that's a good thing, that's wonderful. But what if I do it so much I avoid and neglect my family? What are you afraid of missing out on? I really want to make the top 200. I was so close last year. But the cost of me making that list might be greater than what gaining, getting on the list. What's it going to cost me? Time with my kids, relationship with my spouse, being a good youth pastor, doing ministry, serving others. But this whole idea that I'm afraid I'm going to miss out just kind of creates this waste. So I'll tell you a story. My, so my daughter, she loves life cereal. Anybody else like life cereal? She likes cinnamon life especially. But if you've ever bought life cereal, it comes in the smallest box and costs almost twice as much. And of course, that's what my daughter likes, you know, figures, right? So we would buy it and we'd put it out there. And I started noticing we'd go in through like a box a week. And I'm thinking, but the only person really eating this is my daughter. And she's only this big. I'm like, how can she down a box of life cereal a week? And she eats her cereal dry. She didn't even put milk on it. It was like, ugh, gross. But that's what she does. Well, I finally started noticing this. She would pour the milk, she'd pour the cereal in, eat about two or three or four or five little squares, and throw the rest in the trash. Because you know what? To her, it wasn't hers. It didn't cost her anything. And she was actually thinking she was doing the right thing by cleaning up after herself. She thought, look, look, Dad, I'm doing what you told me. You told me to clean up. I dumped this in the trash. I put that in the sink. Look, Dad, look at me. And I'm going, that stuff's like gold flaked or something as much as they charge you for it. And you're dumping it in the trash. <clears throat> and so we have a rule in our, fa- in our family now. Don't waste life. <laughs> right? But there's a lot of us who waste life and we do just the same thing. God has given us this great resources in our life. He's given us... He's given us talents and gifts and abilities. And Jesus in his prayer is saying, it's given to you to use today. It's given to you to use it. It was not meant to be thrown away. We have limited resources, a limited lifetime to make an eternal difference. Does that make sense? A limited lifetime. We have a limited lifetime and a limited amount of of, of, resources to make an eternal difference. And if we're just throwing it away each day, we're trashing it. We're wasting life. Don't waste life. It's valuable. It's pricey. It came, it cost somebody. It was a sacrifice. And so as we kind of look at this, this thing, don't waste life, what are you afraid of missing out on? And you put so much of your attention on not missing out on this one thing that if you were honest, it has caused you to waste life. If my complete focus becomes on becoming in the top 200 of real estate in the city of Indianapolis, I am wasting opportunities on something that is temporary. I am wasting opportunities. I'm wasting resources, and the biggest resource I have is my lifespan, and I'm wasting that on trying to achieve something that is temporary and superficial and will Gone like that the day I die. It'll be another plaque on the wall. Dusty after a few years. What are you afraid you're going to miss out on? That if you were honest, you've been wasting your life achieving. What really matters. So the question is, what if I depended on God? The Bible says in Matthew 16, verse 26, says this. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can when anyone give in exchange for their soul? When we're so focused on what we're missing out on, and we're not living the day that we live in, we're wasting our soul. We're wasting a chance. We're wasting opportunities. We're forfeiting our soul for something earthly. What have you been doing that with? How would it be different if you depended on God with that thing? If I changed my, my desire to be in the top 200 of real estate and I chose to be number one in my kid's life. If I chose to spend my time discipling my kids. 
if I'd spent, I took my time and, and started sharing with my wife what's going on. It's important. And the word out of our passage that we talked about was to give us today. This passage goes with the word today. It's a today thing. It's to be happened today. If you're worrying about what you're missing out tomorrow, you're wasting today. Don't waste life. Next one. This is a tough one. <clears throat> what if I fail at blank? This is another driving force that we do. And as Jesus tells us to, to give us today our daily bread, he's basically also challenges some folks. He goes, he knows that one of the things, the needs that we have is what if I fail? It's a fear that resides in every one of us. What if I fail? And so I've got to kind of think through this. So I've got to go, well, if, if I get this, don't get this job, things are done. So I'm not even going to apply. I don't think I'm good enough, a sense of unworthiness. When we're so focused on what if things are going to fail, we fail to do anything. You hear that? If we're so afraid of failing, we fail to do anything most of the time. It just, it's, it's, it's a stagnation that we get into. And usually it's because we, we lose track of what we've been given. We lose track of what we're really focused on trying to do. And we lose, some of us just feel overwhelmed. I'll show you my, my thing. I'll show you the illustration. Can you put up the picture of the chair? I wish I could get a better picture, but underneath my clothes there is a blue chair. It's under there, I promise you. It's under there. This is the blue chair that sits in my room, and each day when I use, about three or four weeks ago, it was actually clean. I would like to say that I did it, but I didn't. Uh, Jen did that. She cleaned off the chair and had it look all nice and special, and it's useful, and it's got, you know, we could sit in it, and we kind of we sit there and talk. We could sit in it, and it's a nice chair, and it's right there in our bedroom, and it's just a nice place to sit, maybe read. One day, though, I came home from uh, work, and uh, I think I was doing my police duty hobby thing, and I came home, and I threw my, my long johns on it, because it was really late at night, and I threw the long johns on the chair. Well, the next day, I woke up, and I didn't really need the long johns, so they stayed there, and I wore another set of clothes. Got home about half the day, wanted to change out of what I work in, and I wanted to say, hey, I'm going to go maybe play with the kids in the backyard. So I took off those clothes, and guess what I did? I, I, I put them on that chair. Then I took off those clothes at night. It was kind of dark. I didn't really want to deal with putting them, putting them away in the dirty clothes because that's five steps away. That's stupid. Um, <laughs> so I threw them on the chair. Then the next day, I did pretty much the exact same thing. And um, that's about three weeks' worth of clothing right there underneath that on that chair. That is just the reality of the chair. And I am hoping that someday some miracle will come along and clean the chair for me again. But it's really unlikely it's going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> now you go, why am I telling you about a dumb chair? Well, because when we get into this thing of failure, this is how we feel. Little things have built up over time that have now overwhelmed us. And it has taken away the usefulness of the chair just like it's taken away the usefulness of us. We don't feel very usable because we look at this chair and we go... I have so much stuff to deal with today, now, I don't know how to get out of underneath it. I'm so afraid that if I start sorting through these clothes, I'm going to find some stinky stuff in there. And you probably will. <laughs> I hate to say those, see the jeans sitting there on top. That's what I'm wearing right now. <laughs> I would also like to tell you they've been washed since they were there. They have not. How many people have just put them in the dryer, get the wrinkles out? That's what I did this morning about 8 a.m. They are nice and don't touch them. They're gross. So, so we get worried about what's on the chair. And so we have this mentality that many of us, we're so afraid of failing. And we had maybe one day where we did fail and I failed to put my clothes up one day. And then the next day comes along and I, it's so much easier once you fail a little bit to just throw some more stuff on there. And then you throw some more on there. And then the heck's can't sit in the chair anyway, it's better, I just throw it on there more. Anybody feel this way in their life? You feel overwhelmed. The idea of cleaning that chair is just overwhelming. The fear of what you might find is scary, stinky. And so in this passage, what Jesus says, he goes, he goes give us this day 
our daily bread. And this whole idea of just this daily thing, each day we make a decision whether to throw something on the chair and let it build up and add up. But Jesus is saying, well, I want you to pray daily for the important things of life. And in the process of praying daily, that chair stays clean. If we take our basic emotional and spiritual needs to God on a daily basis, on a daily basis, we take our physical, emotional, and spiritual needs to him on a daily basis and ask for the true things that are necessary and important, we stay useful. We stay in, we, we are actually usable for our intended purpose. And so the idea that this prayer is saying, daily, come to me. And let's deal with it before you throw it before you throw it back and it clutters your life again, let's deal with it daily. Let's focus on the essentials. Let's keep you useful. So my challenge is, what's, what's this? What if I depend on God for the things I fear to fail at? The Bible says this, Matthew 6. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will deal with whatever hard things come when when the time comes. Don't worry about tomorrow. There's worries coming. Deal with today. At the end of the day, the beginning of the day, deal with it. Go to him. God, help me meet these needs. And so this is our Daily, the word daily. There's going to be hard times coming. Some of you guys got some chairs that are buried pretty deep. But the cool thing is every once in a while, every when you go to God, he's patient like Jen. He's loving like Jen. Okay? But he's way more loving. Because I know when she sees that chair, she gives me a dirty look sometimes. <laughs> I get to look like, really, again? God doesn't do that. God goes, come. Let me help you clean off that chair. Come, daily. Let me help you keep it clean. Come, daily. So we can deal with the essentials, the important things, the bread of life. Final thing with share is just, I, I was very fortunate a few years ago. I'm sorry, sorry, a few months ago, I went bike riding, and I ran into an old youth group kid. And this is one of those kids that I was just really, really close to. I mean, she was probably as close to her family. Uh, her brother was in my youth group. She was in my youth group. Her younger brother was in my youth group. And I really, I would actually go on vacations with a group of families from this church, and I would stay with this family. And we'd all go on this vacation. And basically, when the adults wanted to go do stuff, because I was like in my 20s, I wasn't really a real adult. That's how they looked at me. Um, and still considered now. Uh, they would go do stuff, and I'd hang out with the young people, because they were all in my youth group. So they'd give me lodging, and I would get to go and go skiing in Colorado. Perfect deal. I spent a lot of time with them. After one of those ski trips, I remember while on one of the ski trips, I said to Faith, I said this, I go, I hope someday I can have a marriage like that one. Three months later, they divorced. And I had to deal with the family just going through this. And so I was so close to them, and I was kind of like part of the family is what I felt like at the time. I'd do Thanksgiving dinner there because my parents would go elsewhere. And it was hard. And in the process of this divorce, I got pushed out. And you think, well, you know, that's just part of it. I mean, that's part of your role as a youth pastor. Ran into her about a couple of months. This is, that's been 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. And I ran into her. Now she's a mom. And she was out in the front yard. And she said this thing. So she goes, and just for talking, she goes, you know what? I don't know where I would be if it hadn't been for your presence and guidance back in those days. And you know what? My heart just crushed. I was like, I'm not going to cry. You know, I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. I'm not crying. Because it was so awesome to hear her gratitude. And it made all those times and all that stuff just go away. All the sacrifice was worth every bit of it. To know that you made a difference in the life of someone else. 
God is calling us to be that for others. More importantly, God wants us to have that attitude with him. That we wake up daily and we go, God, I don't know where I would be without your presence and guidance in my life on a daily basis. That's what God desires. That's what this prayer is about. Your position changing to one of gratefulness and of humbleness, humility, and appreciation. That's what this part's about. Even for those of us who live in a world of surplus, God knows we have needs that can't be met by this world. Let me close in prayer.